Ciao, and welcome to the Frontier Space Podcast, a dialogue about how space technology and exploration are transforming our solar system. Welcome, Dr. James Giz- Gimsguski. J- Jim Gimsguski, is, is that how you... Jimsevsky, yeah. Jimsevsky, yes. Well, welcome to the Frontier Space Podcast. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we're, we're honored to have you here today, and... and to speak about your exciting work and research. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess uh, on, as we kind of shift our mindset toward um, you know listening to the vibrations and sounds of uh, biological systems and and abiotic systems, or uh, looking backward, you know what. What were your aha moments? My what? Your aha uh, uh-huh moments. Yeah. It's kind of... oh, oh, the many. I mean, whenever you do some type of research, a lot it's frustration. You're trying to get things to work that don't work. That's the nature of research. And then sometimes things work really beyond your expectations. Oh. Uh, but probably my moment, the first one, maybe goes back to the 80s where, you know, we, at IBM in Zurich, where I worked, we were just uh, work, uh, developing a new microscope and then we could see, I could see molecules. That was probably uh, one of the first uh, big moments in my, my career, yeah. To use some new type of technology, the scanning tunneling microscope in this case, follow, it was followed by the atomic force microscope, but to see uh, molecules, yeah, when people believed that you couldn't see molecules with this microscope. So that, that was an um, aha moment. But I had many, you know, throughout my career, I could sit here and talk for half an hour about aha moments. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's um, reading about, um, is that one, uh, some of those initial experiments over there in uh, uh, Austria you did um, on uh, with the, the experiment with the yeast cells that, that really kind of shocked the world? Oh, yeah, the yeast cells. That was um, at UCLA. Um, yes. And yeah, it was interesting that we could see mechanical motion from cells and that work um i mean it was uh on yeast right but it certainly probably initiated my interest in what i would call mechanobiology you know which is something that i'm very interested in um and you can define the mechanobiology as any kind of mechanical mechanical effect that occurs in uh, biological systems like cells and tissue and so on. Uh, And I think uh, it was a different direction to look at uh, living systems from mainly people are very obsessed with genetics, you know, they have a lot of tools they can understand the the role of genetics and uh, disease and the likes. And then there was uh, proteomics where protein expression, things like that um, are an important marker, biomarker. Um, But there are mechanics as uh, as I would say over the last maybe 20 years, the the amount of research on mechanical properties, um, cells and living systems has increased dramatically. Um, And, my particular area moved from in the motion of things, which was what sort of was, I could tell you why we looked at the motion, but it moved on to um, understanding details of the mechanical deformations of uh, cells and re- relating that to disease state, physiological disease state, namely. Um, 
metastasis in cancer. Yeah, it was really interesting. Um, in, in before the the, the cancer study, you um, want to go over some of the details here. Um, so you, you guys discovered the cell wall rose and fell by three nanometers, which was the amplitude of the sound wave, and, and mm -hmm. this happened nearly a thousand times per second, um, and 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 then converted this 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 sound wave frequency into a eight hundred eighty hertz. Um, Really. Yeah, we took the, the motion of the cell wall and for fun, we, um, we didn't change the frequency, we just changed the amplitude. It's very small nanometers. So we moved it up to yeah, millimeters, which would be, you know, the scale of a speaker motion, right? So we just changed the motion from the cell and played it back through a speaker essentially and that was uh <laughs> and then um they gained a lot of attention from mm, partially in the scientific community but also on i would say the most response i got was from people involved in alternative medicine who are uh interested in sound and vibrations um, and certainly, if you take also from traditional Chinese medicine, the idea that sound is a, the ultimate diagnostic tool. Uh, I remember uh, actually visiting even in Beijing and in a uh, uh, traditional Chinese medicine uh, institute where they were uh, developing technologies to try to analyze disease state from people's uh, voice it's quite interesting yeah a lot of potential there uh, and so in this approach you guys um uh with the yeast cells that were five microns in length there was um you guys realized that this microscope probe on these plant cells um was uh much better to, to position um, because of this rigid cell wall than, than mm -hmm. the other more uh, uh, softer um, uh, mammalian cells. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, we did those experiments on yeast cells because uh, we actually wanted originally to look at stem cells, um, particularly stem cells, which differentiate into cardiomyocytes. That was work with a friend of mine, uh, Carlo Ventura, who was in Italy. But well, because it, you know, um, all sorts of stuff, including 9-11, it wasn't possible to transport those cells. So we decided just to look at yeast cells because they're robust and easy to study. And that's where we saw this effect. Um, However, yeast cells are very stiff. They're really, you know, like if we can comparing jello and uh, I don't know, something like stiff plastic. Mm. Um, and so the technology to, there's a couple of things, the technology to study very soft cells and the motion of soft cells is difficult. We have studied, um, mechanical motion in cells, and we can see it relates to there are different molecular machineries inside the cell that cause that motion. But it's been very hard to uh, understand the kind of songs that nature sings, if you like, on, the, in, in, on these very soft cells. You know, the cells in your body, um, a lot of them are they would, they would be a bit like jello in a way, the kind of uh, cell itself. In between the cells, there's stiff material, extracellular matrix material and uh, stroma. And it's pretty stiff. But the idea that the cell is working like some kind of perfect mechanical oscillator, like a little bell or something, um, that is uh, an oversimplification. 
And in reality, there is a lot of mechanical motion going on in cells. Um, I'm sure nature doesn't do things for no purpose. And, I'm, and there is communication between cells mechanically. Um, but we just keep learning new stuff about um, cells and biology. And probably recently I've been studying um, things called exosomes, which are tiny little nanoparticles that are emitted from cells and they are sent from one cell to another and they're like a, a FedEx system of uh, communication of uh, uh, genetic and, and proteomic material. They can be responsible for the spread of cancer. They can be, um, they can also be, have a, pro a, a protective effect. So we just keep learning more and more. And I think uh, the development of these microscopes where you can actually see how much of your body is, uh, the action is occurring on the nanoscale. That's something that, um, as a, these tools have allowed people to see more and more about other sides to the cell aside from genetics and, and proteomics. Yeah, um, a, a, a question that comes to mind too is um, uh, what uh, like membrane oriented um, cellular processes are, um, you know, induce the most vibrations? Well, you know, there are things like philopodia, things that cause the motility of cells. You know, the ce cells don't just sit there and do nothing. They move, you know. Um, they feel their neighbors. If you take a, you know, something we published a while back and other people have also published is if you take um, a stem cell and it's um, differentiated into a cardiomyocyte, a heart cell. Um, if it's if these um, stem cells are on a stiff surface or on a soft surface, they will differentiate in different ways. So they pick up a mechanical cue from the properties of the material around them. Um, so if you have a very stiff substrate, maybe you get some bone cells. If you have very soft substrate, maybe you get neuronal cells, things like that. So the mechanical properties that surrounding have an effect. Um, in terms of mechanical motion, if you induce mechanical motion into cells with this microscope, just touch it tiny amounts. And you do that for a while, you will also induce changes in the cell. I wouldn't say we have characterized them in great detail. And then, you know, there's the, the thing that you're interested in particularly, which has proved to be probably the most difficult is the, uh, the idea of the sound of a cell. And I think it's a, it's a very interesting concept and maybe the, the sound of the cell can certainly, would have a diagnostic potential. Um, however, the measurement of it is really difficult. And I, I think I could give you one analogy is if I'm speaking at the moment to you. And the reason you can hear me is uh, inside my body, there are cells that are working together in my throat, generating vibrations, right? So, you know, the human body can generate all sorts of vibrations and sounds. Now, if, if you were to listen to that, would it have a therapeutic effect? Probably on one hand, no, because I am generating the vibration inside of my body, my cellular system. But when you listen, Maybe you're listening with your ears and it doesn't have an effect. On the other hand, if you go from, um, you know, very, I mean, when you work in, um, in biology, you have to be very precise and you can make uh, crazy statements necessarily. But on the other hand, we know that uh, chanting, um, things like that, more on the side of, you can say, alternative kind of medicine and things like that does have an effect um yeah i feel like um 
uh, curious on the uh, how much of the uh, sound we're listening to is a function of endocytosis or or exocytosis, and 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 how these vibrations we can model them with uh, the harmonic oscillator function. Well, I don't know about exocytosis and endocytosis. Yeah, these processes are occurring in the cell. And as I mentioned, the exosomes, these nanoparticles, are involved in, in, in you know, transporting information from one cell to another. Okay, that's... But um, the role of uh, vibration there, I'm not sure. In terms of... Um, harmonic oscillators, that's where uh, I would say the system is definitely a soft biological system. It's hard for it to be a, as far as we can see at the moment, it's hard for it just to behave like a harmonic oscillator. So, you know, physicists uh, take complex problems and then come up with some simple linear equation, right? And the harmonic oscillator is one of the classics. It's um, if you look at the vibration of a atom, of a molecule, sorry, that vibration of that molecule like this, that follows the maths approximately, not completely of a harmonic oscillator. But if you wanted to talk scientifically, you would say that a cell would be a highly damped system. It's not um, there's a thing called a quality factor. So the more perfect a tone be, you know, it would have a high quality factor, we say. There's a number you can associate with it. But if you have a, a big lump of putty on the table and you try to induce some kind of frequency in there, it's a low, um, it's, it's, it's a low uh, quality system. It's highly damped. The mathematics for uh, understanding the mechanics of a cell, if you took the harmonic oscillator, you just stick in a high damping factor, but that wouldn't describe really what goes on in terms of the uh, motion of cells. It's much more complicated. If you look at the spectrum of the cell, you don't see a definite peak like you would see in uh, the East case. You see something very broad, maybe something that represents what we would call a power law, which is a kind of straight line rather than a peak. And uh, yeah, power laws certainly interest me. They're, it's a power laws are maybe the results of highly complex systems where um, all the components are interacting, but it's a it's no longer linear. And it makes sense that, to me that probably biology is not going to try to behave like um, a physics experiment, you know, with its uh, nice, simple mathematical formula, you know. Yeah, I was wondering um, if um, we could put this nano microphone atomic force microscope, you know, inside a cell, maybe bound to a microtubule, or um, I feel like we're, we might be missing a lot of important sounds. Yeah. From the yeah. yeah, I think um, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's very hard to get funded for things that are not mainstream, you know, uh, but it certainly would be possible. And some Japanese colleagues I know have done an experiment where they actually take this very, it's a carbon nanotube, it's like a nanometer diameter needle essentially. And they have inserted it in a cell. And if you um, were to gently touch, for instance, the nucleus of the cell, yeah, you would see, you would see some interesting um, activity. We haven't done that. It's you know, it's an experiment that requires quite a lot of money and uh, I'm working on other things we, you know, that I'm funded by F4. So if anybody is out there on the podcast, they would like to, um, you know, uh, yeah, finance such a study, I would be 
happy to do it. And that is uh, to use like a nanometer, like needle-like um, structure to interrogate what goes on inside a cell. And the reason I think that, you know, what you said is a, is a reasonable approach is you see, we have this cell and there's stuff going on inside. So when you look at the outside, okay, we, the cell wall, you pick up something, but it's like uh, maybe you're behind the door, you know, somebody's talking in a room and, and, and you're behind the door trying to listen, okay? That's the equivalent of uh, the experiment we did with the atomic force microscope on the cell wall. But if you take such a complex system, it would be much better to go inside and listen, go through the door. And so, yeah, you could, um, you could certainly do that experiment using, uh, you know, sufficiently sophisticated equipment, which we indeed do have. Yeah, I wonder if this whole process of <clears throat> these exosomes and endosomes, we could just put something in inside and you know just pass through the membrane and mm -hmm. yeah yeah well you know the cell recognizes certain things on the cell surface and uh, the likes of the exosome you know has certain certain messages on the outside that talks to the cell and then it says oh yeah come in and then it comes in and then it say releases some you know, genetic material that modifies that cell. Um, in a similar way, you can introduce, you know, a nano, like one nanometer diameter probe into the cell, and it probably won't um, complain too much, at least for a while. Yeah, and... Um some kind of like mini uh, AFM cantilever. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you know, we, we, we have tried uh, different, different approaches. So certainly the idea of the tip of the cantilever, that's the atomic force microscope. It feels surfaces, it feels shapes. Um, it can measure tiny forces, that's certainly probably the the approach we've taken throughout most of our um, biological work because it it's it it's it's a complicated technique but we we can handle it um there are other methods again they have their limitations like to fire for instance a laser not a powerful laser just a gentle soft laser beam and then attach tiny mirrors to the biological object and then look at the reflection. We have done that. We did that in the case of the metamorphosis. Um, um, uh, it was a butterfly chrysalis into the emergence of a butterfly. We could follow those motions using small mirrors. Today, there are also so many new techniques around uh, optical techniques. In the past, they had a limited resolution and people have got Nobel prizes for fi finding ways to make those optical probes um, capable of seeing things on the nanoscale. Um, yeah, there are many, there are many different types of technology we can apply to the problem. Um, yeah. It was, however, there's still the ultimately, you know, it's not clear what they do, but it's clear that they do, do perform an important function, motion. You know, your blood cells are, are, are the way they are and your arteries are the way they are because you have a certain type of flow and that motion on the cells and um, influences how they behave. Um, yeah, it's almost like these vibrations, they're, they're a mathematical function of cell communication to some extent. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. But um, 
it's like hearing a piece of music. Um, you know, you maybe you want to hear dee dee dee, you know. You want to hear that that's and you talk about harmonic oscillators, but what happens when you actually just hear you know, some kind of some kind of stuff like that that's um it's not white noise, it's not random noise, but it's um some language and that language we don't understand. So if you meet somebody and they're speaking a completely different language, uh it takes you a while to figure out what they're telling you. <laughs> yeah, it's quite, quite interesting, isn't it? especially in terms of these ion channels too, and, and, and mm -hmm. proteins that are trafficking mm -hmm. every which way. Um, yeah, the you know, in biology, we, you'll find that our medicine and you know things related to cytology and so on. People have uh, developed specialities, and each one has a different speciality. We we worked with neuroscientists, but then uh, you can talk to one neuro neuroscientist at UCLA who's studying one thing, or somebody studying cardiology study one thing, but they don't study the other thing, and they don't necessarily communicate with each other. So. You know, you have somebody that specializes in a protein, and 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 in general, the whole field, of, you know, medical biological research tends to be people that specialize in one thing. You know, like um, yeah, you know, it's like garage, and they do mufflers, right? Midas mufflers or whatever. So you're not going to go to Midas mufflers to, you know, I don't know fix some something in your gearbox or maybe Midas mufflers do that I don't know but anyway you know they're all specialists and and and, and to look at this larger picture of uh, mechanobiology and all its and its bigger implications that's not something that generally you're going to find people um, doing fundamentally because then you're not an expert in one thing. And if you want to be funded, you have to be an expert in one thing and hammer at it. Um, mm -hmm. So in the field of the sonocytology, I think we are still, we're still waiting to see this. I mean, there are people looking at these mechanical effects all around the world, but it's not established itself like a, genomics or uh, yeah, yeah. Proteomics. and 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 i can see why it's it, because it's not it's not something that you can say it's this okay we see this molecule this or this particular genetic defect this single nucleotide polymorphism or something uh, that's why you have sickle cell disease you know this is a this is what they would like to do it's a process of reductionism it's, you know, the ultimate reductionism, right? Um, and you're looking at one thing, but you don't look at anything around you. And that's a, also a general problem in life. People will look at one thing, but they don't see that that one thing that they're looking at is actually the result of it and else around them and that things are interconnected. Um, so... Yeah, I wanted to jump in there, and, and, and um, I, I think your yeah. what you're you saying know, really resonates. Um, sorry, it, what you're saying really resonates with me, and I kind of feel the 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 challenges, you know. And um, yeah, there are there are great challenges, and and then you have the other side, right? Um, and I don't mean to denigrate these people, but you know, the I call them like new age casualties. Some that people are off on some other trip, you know, like it's, um, I do yoga. So when I do yoga, I'm not necessarily thinking about science, but I, I do feel, you know, inside me, a kind of energy, you know, um, I can feel like, it. And, and in terms of, you know, vibration, certainly chanting is extremely, um, extremely therapeutic and good 
and you can feel things on a ephemeral spiritual level um but those people uh, they start to uh, use scientific terms like quantum mechanics you know we're going to do yoga but instead of just doing yoga we're actually doing quantum mechanics okay and then sit there and uh, the yoga teacher is talking about everything that's quantum mechanics and you know i'm sitting there and i, I love the, the sound the whole thing but i they're trying to use uh, scientific words for uh, in the wrong way. Yeah. There is a phenomena there beyond, uh, you know, just the materialistic. But unfortunately, they start to use the word quantum mechanics. So in terms of the vibration, people would like to have a frequency that cures cancer, right? So you just turn on your... Um, you turn on your phone, stick in the headphones, and you get the, you know, the universal frequency that's going to change everyone. It's going to cure all your problems. What if we do that inside the cell too? Sorry? What if we could do exactly that inside the cell? Maybe, maybe, maybe something is possible. I would say if you, if you certainly, we have in our experiments when we had these when we're looking at cells and we 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 poke them if you poke them enough it starts to change the the structure of the cell so they will start to make more what you call actin filaments these are like structural elements in the cell they will actually produce them and change things yeah you know there are you know, people that say green tea is good for cancer. We have done experiments and we've shown that if you take cell cultures and even human cells and, you know, uh, patients that have cancer, if you take their cells and you put green tea on it, it will stiffen the cells. Now, is that a cure for cancer? No, it's not a cure for cancer. Can you, that, is it good to drink tea, green tea? Yeah, it's good to drink tea, but uh, green tea it has catechins in it. But on the other hand, are these bioavailable to the cells that need them, you know, where you, maybe you have a metastasis and, that's, and, and you can stiffen that cell so it doesn't trans, you know, translocate to some other location in the body. Yeah, it, there are many, uh, there are many, you know, it's more complicated. The, the, the problem is it's more complicated in a way. Ultimately, it may not be more complicated. Uh, ultimately, it may, there may be something simple. It may be indeed possible to um, generate a type of motion in a cell where you start to change the chromosome dynamics in a specific way and certainly if you change that you can then change um, all sorts of phenomena you know like the um the whole thing with yeah because because you know each each intracellular process they oscillate at, at a specific frequency and you know we can monitor how far away those deviations are from the norm and mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah, did, did they, they, you know, if you ever look at you know some cell signaling pathways things like that um it is just like an endless list right and then this does that that does this this goes there that does that that triggers that um and people have a catalog of things they do but it it, I don't know if it gets them that much farther, you know, in some cases, yeah, maybe they can learn something and cure disease, but by forever looking into minutia and details of things, something comes out, but there may be a bigger picture behind it, and I think that's what you're maybe alluding to, you know, but within us, there is, um, you know, there are other processes like the, um, these mechanical 
to call them vibrations or whatever you like, that are uh, more even fundamental maybe to the life force and that we miss them by constantly doing chemical analysis and yeah. Yeah, you, stuff, you, you know. Your, um, your 2007 study um, entitled the nanomechanical analysis of cells from, from cancer patients really stood out and, and you, uh, you measure the cell stiffness and elasticity and um, associated the shape changes and it made some pretty uh, incredible discoveries. <laughs> Yeah, that was uh, that was a good uh, moment. I mean, at that time when we published it, we were, you know, we know all the data was good, even we did was good. Um, but what was nice was that when, you know, I think at least probably as close to a thousand papers since that people looking at different things to do with cancer and mechanics that have confirmed what we see. So that was, that, that, that was potentially great, is understanding this role of mechanics. And that's why the mechanobiology is uh, a really exciting area. There are many other types of mechanobiology you can look at. Um, and so potentially it's a, a biomarker. Um, however, uh, it doesn't, it, we are just starting to understand a bigger question. It's not, it doesn't really matter if you have cancer or don't have cancer. I mean, probably everybody has cancer, one, you know, or they have cancer today and a couple of days later, they don't. Um, it's the uh, degree on which it takes hold of your body. I mean, and, uh, there is not really a number you can go into a hospital and say, yeah, you have, uh, you have some form of cancer that's gonna kill you in a week or this, or you can probably spend the rest of your life with it and it's not gonna be a problem, you know? There is no way to quantify it. And cancer is just a, such a generalization for probably, you know, 10 years from now, we'll be looking at it and thinking, it's just a, it was just a blanket term for many things, you know? Yeah, and I, I do think these, the, the correlations you mentioned in the study, you know, you and your team, you guys discovered the cell stiffness of the metastatic cancer cells are 70% softer with, with a much less standard deviation. And the, the specifically the tumor cell elasticity, elasticity was 0.56 kilopascals um, and, and whereas the average cell had a 2.1 kilopascal stiffness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the mesothelial cell is inside, we were looking inside fluid inside the patient's lungs. It's a thing called a pleural effusion. And normally they, they look at that under a microscope and people who they, they have to do it every so often because, you know, it can recur essentially the cancer. And then if you have circulating tumor cells, you're not in, in, a, in, a, in a particularly good shape. So, yeah, the, the, the metastatic cancer cells were 10 times softer. So they were really like a soft jelly. And so it was, it's very clear. You can identify them in, um, in, a, in such a liquid sample taken from a patient's lung. It doesn't mean they have lung cancer, by the way. They can have any types of cancer. As long as they circulate in, um, tumor cells, they will find themselves in some fluid pocket, namely the lungs. And uh, yeah, that was, a, that, was a great, this, that was a great observation. What we've been trying to do since then is to see if we could quantify the, um, the mechanics of the cell and try to say, oh yeah, this is very bad. And this is, you know, it's not gonna cause much trouble. That's a difficult process. And I don't think um, the medical community have a good way to quantify, um, you know, how bad cancer is. And their understanding it, 
probably it's going to, certainly going to change over the next 10 years and maybe we we have a new approach and then we find no one is going to get cancer but presumably you're going to die from something else you know i don't know what that will be <laughs> hopefully you die i mean if everybody lives forever we're going to have a terribly miserable existence yeah no, um, and it filled up with people and no food, you know, and climate change and not it. Yeah, it. Um, on on the broader topic of these uh, atomic force microscopes, it sounds like we can, you know, use them to to really monitor and observe these receptor ligand interactions, physiochemical and and mechanical properties of bacterial cells and, and biological materials, and um, even uh, um, a. a abiotically you know we monitored the deformation the depth and adhesion forces and the modulus and we, um these these afms they they can be applied to microelectric devices and, and polymers mm -hmm. energy storage tribology and, and so many things um, yeah the afm the development afm starting back in 86 no one could have guessed uh, it would have so many um applications and particularly be used even even used in in a biological system it's pretty amazing um yeah yeah some some researchers was, was reading they, they diagnose their problems with the microscopes by by listening to the microscopes um, who somebody said that or? yeah yes reading um in the study here uh you uh, can pull it up um, uh, let's see, uh, Modi, and then uh, it's from uh, Modi published a study on the sounds of science. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot. There was a lot of interest in uh, in sound. There also, you know, I'm also involved in art science projects which in which artists become involved in in scientific issues um, and i'm the director of the art science center at ucla the scientific director and so when you deal with very complex phenomena and as i said you know scientists we like to add on but most scientists like to reduce it down to a tangible problem, you know, yes or no, Y equals, you know, I don't know, some simple mathematical equation. On the other hand, scientists, uh, you know, artists are, um, artists are really interesting to work with because once you have an artist in the lab, they, they look at it differently because they are used to look at complex problems. They're not trying to reduce something they're maybe they have an interpretation they're not limited by all the roles we have and so they come up with some very interesting ideas and there are amazing uh, sound artists out there um, who actually work with biological systems so uh, recent well recently and in the past, we've had actually artists come in to try to study the, the sound of cells. Um, there's one lady, she was in the laboratory for, uh, I think, three or four months. She was recording the, the motion of cancer cells, and she was trying to um, do something with that. I think she's, I mean, she's still working on it. I don't know exactly what 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 the conclusions are but everyone should be able to yeah everyone should have their own sort of take on um on, on, on cutting edge science experiments as well as the scientists i think it's interesting to hear all the different views and sometimes people come up with you know very interesting ideas i mean i didn't come up with the idea to sonif sonificate the or sonify uh, the cells. That was an artist that um, um, I was working with at that time on a 
uh, art science project to do with nanotechnology suggested that we uh, convert it into sound. And once it was converted into sound, rather than being a trace on a piece of paper, right? Once people heard it, it, it did generate all of this interest in, uh, in sonocytology. It's good. Yeah. Um, imagine uh, converting the sounds into fractals and um, the, this, this vibrational approach is, is very similar to the piezo actuators too that are common on a lot of rovers. And um, it was, was also reading about um, the, and in all sorts of other vehicles and systems um, is um, the, there's also this important concept of the active vibrational and, and the passive system mon vibrational monitoring and, and um, yeah would, um, and, and so this passive system we can listen to um, also these the, the, the abiotic non-living systems to monitor crack propagation um, and, and Frequency response is interesting. Crack propagation, yeah, that's interesting. <clears throat> that's, um, yeah, that uh, relates to phenomena that interest me, which is called the, the dragon, dragon tails. But I think we have to leave that for another time because we're already, I think we're already up. In yeah. Terms of the interview. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know if, you know, what I said is, uh, it's given you, it's, uh, I'm trying to give you a kind of a realistic uh, picture of where we are with uh, mechanics and cells. So there is a lot of work going on um, in terms of the, the idea of the um, frequency. What is the magical sound that will, uh, sway over the cells and change them. We, we, we are not there. Um, and one of the, probably the biggest thing that holds that back, and I can understand it, is the uh, reluctance of uh, people in science to accept um, the idea of, of of sound being an integral part of your um, of your of your life, of how you, of why cells exist or groups of cells exist, how they function, you know, um, we're still fairly much focused still on molecular type approaches. Like, yeah, um, just imagining this large audible data gap you know some kind of like I, I think we could almost predict some 10 to 100 fold increase in audible data by you know within the next 10 years or something um, yeah yeah oh yeah i think um the technology exists um the best way to do it or at least the um let's say the funding required for that still it does not exist but certainly if we could follow the mechanical interaction all the uh, organelles nucleus and so on inside a cell um, I think we would have uh, a dramatic breakthrough in medicine um, one that probably initially is met with skepticism, but nevertheless, I think it's something that's uh, real and sustainable. It's there and uh, it's a matter of time. That's, uh, profound yeah. and inspiring. Um, yeah, we, uh, we had two more questions here, um, if, more on the long lines of research that we'll, we'll be doing too. Um, or, um, but I imagine the data analysis is kind of equally as important um, in, in terms of um, fast Fourier and, and, and integral analysis uh, and post-processing, but um, were two 
projects we're, we're, we're really interested in, um, you know, potentially collaborating with you and, and uh, putting an, one of these AFM microscopes, um, you know, on, on a cell surface um, in microgravity, you know, and, 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 and helping guide such an experiment to, to monitor the, um, this, uh, the, the extreme uh, cytoskeleton disorganization in, in microgravity, because there's, it, they're very similar um, be behavior to, to cancer cells in the 3D spheroid formation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, that's, uh, that's a great idea. Uh, you know, I was uh, many years ago, uh, I was involved in a project that was, uh, it was a big project. Uh, it was uh, funded by, it was funded by NASA, if I remember right. And it was called the, was it the Institute for Cell Mimetic Research? Um, and that work, uh, CMIS, that was the name it. And basically it was uh, a project aimed at with different tools and systems to look at um, biological systems under uh, zero gravity. So in terms of space ex exploration, uh, what are the uh, you know, physiological effects of being in space for long periods of time? You know, and there are all sorts of problems with bones and, and, and what you're saying about cells, yeah, that's definitely an interesting thing. And can it be done? And the answer is, yeah, sure, it can be done. You know, at the moment, you probably know that on Mars, there is an atomic force microscope. You know that? Yeah. Yeah. So I found I was actually involved in that project uh, way, way back in IBM. And um, we never actually launched it. And then it came back. It was called Phoenix. So, and we have, you know, on the space station, you have 3D printers, all sorts of things. You could build an atomic force microscope in principle. So to do something like that in zero gravity, I think the atomic force microscope would work perfectly because actually there would be, um, very little background noise, right? Because you could isolate the whole thing completely and just focus on the cell. And so maybe um, maybe that would be the best place up there in orbit to actually look for uh, look for this type of um, vibrational or like emotional uh, phenomena in a cell. Yeah, it's one of the most extreme kind of adaptations um mm -hmm. is this um there's a uh, image here what goes on in microgravity we're conducting a literature review with the microtubules and the skeleton um mm -hmm. it, it, it's essentially this um function of you have so much um there's a lack of hydrostatic pressure uh you know, on on the membrane and 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 this, such high forces, you know, significantly reduce the cell volume and um, uh, there's all sorts of junk in the cytoplasm too. And so, so oh yeah, it would um, you know these things would have um, the microgravity or zero gravity or whatever. It's, I would I can imagine, you know, so the the marvelous thing about our body is we adapt to the environment. And we've been designed to adapt to environments. Maybe sometimes we don't adapt very well and we die, but um, I could I could completely see massive changes in the, the cytoskeleton occurring if um, self cultures are left in a zero you know zero gravity state for a sufficient length of time. Yeah. Yeah, um, and the other. Um, exciting, more near-term projects we're, we're, we're planning. We're, we're, we're conducting several experiments during our, our Mars University summer program this June at um, Arizona. Um, and, and we're planning to order um, some atomic force microscopes 
and and you know hopefully observe the interactions of um, the uh, um, the effects of alternative gravity and the near no magnetic field on these Mars microbial candidates. You know, uh, um, mm -hmm. And I would love to discuss collaborating and, and really. Yeah, that would be interesting. You could also, yeah, I'm sure you could also grow them in, um, you know, also high gravity. So, in a, you know, like some kind of a centrifugal system, you know, so you could do normal gravity here you could yeah do zero gravity and high gravity and i'm sure we'll you, you'll see you'll see you'll see definitely very interesting changes and maybe learn some about adaptation from it yeah yeah i find your mars thing interesting you know uh is maybe uh i guess six or seven years ago i went to australia and I took a bunch of students from UCLA, and there were students from the University of uh, Cambridge, no, Bristol or Cambridge, I think one or the other or both. And some Japanese students came from Japan. And we, we all lived together. And the idea was um, to work out uh, how to live on Mars. We did this. You know, we have a different theme every year, right? And so we did this one and it was quite exciting. So the group, there were maybe 20 students or something, they divided themselves up into groups. So one was to do with energy, the other was to do with shelter, the other was to do with food. And then there was one that was to do with medicine and in particular, you know, psychological, you know, how do you deal with the psych psychological issues? Anyway, they spent a week on it and then they did a presentation and uh, uh, it was really interesting to see what they they came up with in terms of you know living on mars I, it's a it's a great exercise so i don't know what your uh, mars university course you say I, I just briefly looked through it but i think it's something that um it's really exciting even if you don't go to mars it makes you think about also your life on the planet Earth a little bit, you know, the idea of uh, Buckminster Fuller, you know, uh, the idea that our planet is just a spaceship, spaceship Earth, and, uh, and, and it makes you think about caring about it. And of course, yesterday was Earth Day, so uh, that's definitely on my mind. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun thing, the Mars idea. Yes, yes. There's a lot of, a lot of opportunity to, I think. Um, to, I'm a bit too old to go to Mars, uh, so I'll have to stay on Earth, but I'm sure you could go. <laughs> hopefully one day, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and, and hopefully, you know, we'll reach out to you down the road and, and we'll collaborate on, mm -hmm. on some audio data and, and, and if, if you if you if you're planning to do something like that yeah sure i can I, i'd be happy to give you advice and i have you know a lot of experience in it too much experience but um yeah awesome. so anyway thank you and i and i wish you the best for your venture and please keep in contact with me okay Likewise. Thanks so much, James. Yeah. Okay. Bye.